Yes, okay, I think we're ready to go. Welcome everyone to this talk on fast, reliable Swift builds with Buck. Um, thank you all for coming. It's quite late in the evening, and I know this is a pretty Java and JVM-focused conference. But I hope that this talk um, will show you that there are some similarities in the way these tools build. And some of the learnings that we got, uh, that we applied here, actually we took from the Android development in Buck. Um, so even though this will mostly be Swift and iOS related examples, I hope that you can take something away from the ideas behind this talk. So, my name is Robert van Ginkel. Um, I'm a software engineer at Uber Engineering in Amsterdam. Um, I work on our mobile developer platform team there. Um, the mobile developer platform team is a team that supports basically all of our mobile engineers in being as productive as possible with uh, their tooling. So during my tenure in Uber, we scaled from around 20 to 30 engineers per platform to over 200 engineers per platform. And while doing that, we sort of ran into issues where the existing tooling just wasn't enough, wasn't productive anymore. People spend a lot of time fighting their tools instead of actually building and being productive. So that's why we started these mobile developer platform teams. And today I'm going to talk about a very large project that we did on iOS. Um, it's mostly got to do with Swift and Buck, Swift being the new language that we chose at the beginning of 2016 to basically rewrite our apps in. And Buck is basically the tool that we use to achieve that at a decent speed. So let's look at an overview of what we are going to talk about in this talk. So first I'll give you an overview of Swift C, the Swift compiler. We'll talk a little bit about what makes Swift C different from other tools that you might have used before as an iOS engineer and how the compilation model slightly differs, but also how it's interestingly a little bit closer than Java and Kotlin compared to um, a Clang-based language such as C and C++. Um, then we'll look at Buck, a build tool which is very useful when you have a lot of source code in a single repository. And then in the end of this talk, we'll look a little bit about at how the implementation of Swift, at Buck, of Swift in Buck helped Uber and made us more productive. So first, Swift. Swift was introduced in 2014 by Apple as basically their new de facto language for the platform. Swift is currently at version 4. It's gone to a couple of iterations. And it is a compiled language based on the LLVM backend. It's kind of different compared to most languages we see at this conference, uh, which are pretty much always based on the JVM. But there are definitely similarities in how they work. So. Let's look at a very simple Swift example, and I hope everyone is able to follow this. So we, we have three files, basically, a point, a line, and a main file. The point file defines a data structure of type, uh, w which we will call point. It contains an x and a y variable, which are two integers. Um, we also have a line structure, which basically contains two points, a start and an end. And there is a lazy computed variable of what is the line length. Then. To make this a very simple binary that we can actually run, we'll just instantiate one of these lines, give it two points for the start and the end, and then we'll print the line length when we do this. One thing you might notice here is that we have multiple files, but there are no import statements. And this is a completely legit way of writing Swift. And there is a very, uh, like, you can structure your code this way and it will actually compile. In larger projects, it's probably not such a good idea because you can have issues with namespace collusion if basically everything in every file is includable in everything from every other file. So this is not the only way to compile Swift. Oh, missed one point. There's also no explicit main. Swift knows that if you have a main.swift file, you can have top level declarations in there or statements that will actually execute. Small side note, not super important for this example. The more important thing for project structure is we don't have to have everything in Swift files that we compile together. We can actually apply a little bit of structure to our code base. So say, for example, we want to structure our code base more, we could put the Swift uh, or the point and the line structs into a geometry module. A module is very comparable to sort of the package in uh, Java and basically encapsulates a piece of functionality. 
we can then import this module into our main module. And now we do need explicit imports. And basically, to structure a large code base, such as the code base we have at Uber, this is the way to go, because otherwise, your, uh, it, it will be very hard to compile. So you can take this even further. You can make the line its own module. You can make the point its own module. Make sure you have explicit imports between all of these. And what you see now is that um, project structure is actually quite important when compiling Swift. So um, when we look at project structure, um, we need to define a good way of, uh, or a good relationship between all of these uh, modules. And that is something that Buck will help with a lot. But before we actually go look at Buck and how it does implement things, I want to take you through the simple steps that you would take to actually compile Swift manually on the command line. So it makes a little bit more sense um, how you could automate this into a system. So first, let's look at the simple help page for the Swift compiler. Um, what you'll notice here is that Swift takes a set of files, which are the inputs, and these are all the inputs that know about each other. So if you use, or if you define a type in one file, you can automatically use it in the other file, as long as you group those into the same compilation command. You can then use the Swift compiler to either emit object files, or even go further and make the Swift compiler give you a library or an executable, executable that's ready to go. So there is a small nuance in the Swift compiler that is that it's basically structured into a compiler driver and a front end. And the compiler driver is basically what will think about the relationship between if I compile this file first, I need to compile that file as well, then I need to merge some things in the end and maybe link it if you want an executable and library. So that's sort of the task of the compiler driver. Then we have the compiler front end and the front end will actually take a source file look at it, analyze it, create the abstract syntax to type check it, and do everything which is necessary for actually compiling it. So then, besides getting an output like an object file from the Swift compiler, it also has this option called emit module. Quite an important option. These module files, which the compiler can emit, are basically a serialized version of the interface that um, a library exposes, so it can be imported into other uh, modules. So let's look at a little bit more concrete example of this. So we go back to a super simple example of the point, the line, and the main Swift file. If we compile all of these together, we can ask the Swift compiler to give us um, the object files and link all of this together. So these three files go into the Swift compiler at once. The Swift compiler will give us all the object files for all the Swift files and then link them together into a main executable. We can also do it a little bit differently, so as, such as we explored before. We group the point and the line Swift file into the geometry module, and then we have a main module that just imports that. In this case, we only need to start with two Swift files. We can pass these two Swift files to the compiler and ask it for the object file associated with it, as well as the importable module. So we now also have a geometry.swift module artifact, which combined with the main module, we can give the Swift key again. This will give us more object files, which we can then combine link together and make into a real executable. The Swift module file is what enables the import geometry module or import geometry statement in the main.swift file to work. And these are basically the steps you have to take in order to compile Swift in a reasonable way. So this is a very simple example, but imagine that a code base like Uber's, where we share a lot of our code between the four uh, apps we have in production, uh, three apps, my bad. Um, we have on iOS more than 300 of these separate modules. On Android, we have over 1,000. So you need to have a very good and structured way of building those, and Buck really helps us with that. So let's look at Buck. Buck is a tool that was developed at Facebook that helps them build large code bases really fast. Um, it has a declarative build language, which basically means that 
Puck knows very well how to compile certain rules, whether it's how to make a Java jar, how to make an executable for an iPhone, how to make a APK that you can send to the Android or to the Google Play Store. Puck has rules about all of these things that exactly define their inputs and their outputs. And this makes Puck a very opinionated build system, which is not always easy to customize. But what you get back for this is correct incremental builds. And that's a very big thing. Because Buck knows very well what goes into your application and what comes out of the source and how it can combine these things together, Buck will always build correct increment incrementally. And this is huge if you have a large code base. What's even better is because it knows this so well and it knows how to make uh, the artifacts that it produces basically um, machine independent, you can actually share your cache and you can actually share your intermediate build artifacts between a lot of machines, which has the result that if I build some code with Puck and we have a distributed cache that I share in the office with my coworkers, they will never have to build that code again because Buck will know that basically there is a specific input that produces a specific output. And if you didn't change any of the input files and someone else already did the compilation, you don't have to do it again. So that's very useful, especially on CI builds. And Buck is a command line tool. Even though maybe not everyone is as comfortable in like programming in Vim and then writing something uh, on their command line to build, uh, that's why Buck has IDE integration through project generation. So this declarative build language helps you very much in defining a structure for your project. Um, but from this structure, it can actually generate project files. So there's no need to commit any IntelliJ or Xcode or other project files into your repo anymore. There won't be any more conflicts. There's just a very nice uh, declarative language that sort of explains how your project should be built. And we can also generate projects with that. Then the last great thing, Bucks open source. Facebook produced it. Um, it's out there in the world. It's super useful for us because we can play around with it. We can customize it however we want. And we definitely recommend you take a look at it. So let's go back to our example and make everything a little bit more concrete. Um, we again look at the geometry and the main um, modules and sort of look at how they would fit in a bug file. So the bug file is what defines the project structure in bug. And in this case, we say we have a library that we named geometry, and it contains these two source files. We also have a binary named main. It has one source file, the main Swift file, but it also has a dependency, and it has the dependency on this geometry file, or on the geometry module. So this is a very simple example, but Buck has rules for everything, from libraries, binaries, to app bundles, the things you would send to your customers if you want to sign them in specific ways. You can configure all of this. So this gives you a really nice way to structure your project. What's even better about that is because Buck knows this project structure so well, there is a very great query language in Buck. And you can look at how your dependencies are structured. You can find all the paths from one dependency to another. You can basically visualize your tree. Um, if you visual or ask Buck to produce a dot file, which you can then visualize with Graphis. So you've got a very neat representation of all your uh, elements. What's even better about this query language is that it allows you to understand how your code base changed. So using this, you can, for example, find the differences in your code base between one git commit and another. And if you know what changed between those things, you can know exactly which subset of your code base you should be testing. And this is something that is usually useful for us on uh, CI. So we have this rather abstract structure. Um, is defined in sets of targets. So this is a very high level conceptual idea of, okay, I have a main binary. It depends on some other library. And it's not, it doesn't tell you anything about how Buck would execute this. So this is the very high level concept, which is called a target graph in Buck. Then to look at how Buck will actually take this information and create a way of executing this, 
is the process which transforms the target graph into something we call the action graph. And I have an example of an action graph here. Um, I'm going to have to break this down a little bit because it's hard to really visualize and explain this, but I hope this helps. So if we look at this top down, we see that there is a rule for creating the main binary. The rule contains some steps. It will link and strip to produce a binary. The rule also has a specific hash associated with it, and that's what we call the rule key. The rule key can be calculated in different ways, mostly through its dependencies, but I'll talk about that a little bit later after I explain the rest. So to create the main binary, which is linking and stripping, we need the object file from both the main Swift and the geometry Swift compiler. So these are two dependencies that are steps that we have to take first before we can actually construct the main binary. In the same way, the main um, Swift compile rule depends on the Swift file as well as the Swift compiler because also if our tools change or if the version of the compiler changes, we would want to recompile it. So that's why tools such as a compiler would also be independency. Then it also depends on the output and specifically the Swift module file of the geometry Swift compile rule. So that's what the other relationship is about. So to sort of like explain what these cache rule keys do, um, we can look at how this changes when we change the main file. So now you see that here we changed the main Swift file. And we can see that the rule keys for the main Swift compile rule and the main binary rule have changed. So what we can see here is basically that when Buck goes and creates this graph and then executes step by step based on everything that's available, in this case, if you would do a clean build while in the left state, it would have to execute all the rules because there is nothing. But then it will have a cache artifact for the rule associated with the 350 Swift compile um, rule. So then when we would edit the main Swift file, it would construct this graph again, see that part of what it's already, uh, part of what it has to build was already built, so it will never actually execute that and will just use the artifact that you used before or that you created before. Then. What's even better about this is that these cache keys are calculated in such a way that they are machine independent. So what I just mentioned before is like, if I already compile this, this will already be in a cache that me and my coworkers can use, um, which has to be a big advantage that if you just change the main file, then you will only have to do part of the compiling. And this is what makes Buck so powerful for us. So let's look at how powerful it actually is. So in looking at how we rolled out Buck and Swift at Uber, um, we're going to look a little bit about what happened when we rolled that cache out compared to the build times we had before. We look a little bit in the performance analysis that Buck gave us, which was really easy to look at, and then how we customized the build to make it even better. So this is a graph that shows basically the build times that we had on our CI systems for a while. Um, the green line is a setup line. The orange line is what the actual build time was, and then the red line is the actual testing time in addition to the build time. So then when we actually deployed our distributed cache, we saw a significant drop in most of our build times. Not every of our build times, and there is good reasons for that, but most of our builds were actually getting a lot faster. When you see the pretty high peaks in this, it's because even though you create this cache in such a way, if developers update something which is very low down in the uh, graph of stuff you have to execute, basically everything will have to be rebuilt so um, you can still have a correct build. So if someone changes a very low-level logging library, for example, which is included basically everywhere, um, this will trigger a rebuild of the whole code base, which is expected but will still take a long time. By having this cache and being able to share these things across machines, what we were able to do in a very easy way is basically parallelize our testing because we could just build on one machine and then as soon as it was building, we could test it on every other machine because when you would just ask it to build it, it would download it from the cache 
and we don't have to go through a difficult process of sending test artifacts from one machine to another, but it became pretty easy to just parallelize testing. So as I mentioned, it isn't a silver bullet. Depending on what you change in the code base, you'll still have to do a lot of building, but it does help. And we did have to tweak our cache a little bit, make sure we weren't caching the incorrect things, but this is, uh, these are things that Buck allows you to do. So it's actually pretty easy to get in a good working state. So what we actually want to do in the future is make sure that people can locally use the cache we create on CI. Um, this is quite difficult for us on iOS because our IDE integration isn't as top of notch as on Android. But our Android developers are actually able to locally use the cache on CI and this makes their builds even locally quite fast. So then we thought about if our clean builds aren't so fast, are there ways we can even optimize those further? And Buck was a pretty good choice there because it turns out that Buck has a very good way of sort of analyzing your build process and identifying the bottlenecks. So what Buck does in every build is it generates a trace file, very much similar to a Chrome's tracing format. You can actually just open it in Chrome. So when we did that for one of our builds, it became pretty obvious that we had a problem. Um, even though we had eight threads to execute our builds on, for a very big percentage of the build, the build was executed or it was stalling on one thread. And when we investigated further why that was the case, it turned out that it's related to the way we build. So if you look at the point simple line example, and this is why the boxes are drawn around um, the Swift C, Swift module, and object file, is that is an atomic operation. When you invoke Swift C with a Swift file, it will give you the Swift module and the object file. But if you look at the graph of how the dependencies uh, are structured, we actually only need the Swift module file to start working on uh, our next rule, and the object file we don't need until linking. So what we looked at here is like, can we break this up and make it so that we can continue with other rules and parallelize better um, by just having the Swift module file a lot earlier than we have the object file? So, um, quick introduction to the Swift compiler. Swift is an LVM-backed compiler. So if you look at the major stages it goes through from source code to actual assembly, which your computer will execute, it will take the source, transform it into an abstract syntax tree, type check it, and then the next major step is to create the Swift intermediate language representation of your program. This is a representation in which you or in which Swift applies a lot of the optimizations regarding speed and size, and it still contains a lot of Swift-specific information. Then after that, it's lowered in the L, into the LLVM intermediate representation. This is, an, uh, in, in, this is a representation that the LLVM backend compiler can actually turn in the object files. So looking at this, the Swift module is actually available after the sales stage, the Swift intermediate language stage, and we didn't really need to wait for the object to be built. This was just how it was implemented by default. This is what we sort of like went with when we implemented it as well. But then we thought, hey, we can actually optimize this. So we did. And then here's a before and after picture of what happened. Because we could use our threads in such a better way compared to what we had before, we were actually able to reduce the time spent compiling Swift to by 35%, just because we weren't waiting for a big bottleneck in the way our dependencies are structured. So that was pretty powerful for us as well. So let's recap that a little bit. Swift does definitely compile very different from Objective-C. But in some way, it's actually closer to Java, where it doesn't have this defined interface, which you would have in header files. It's just a bunch of source, which you need to compile into some form to be able to use it in dependency. So it compiles per module, and yeah, it has this generated interface I mentioned before. So project structure is pretty important, is something that we, uh, we figured out. Project structure really dictates how easy it is to build your program, 
how easy it is to incrementally build your program. And having a good project structure is something that can really help. Um, and you can help keep your code base healthy and in a good project structure if you have a tool like Buck that makes it very easy to sort of analyze your project structure. Then for us, at scale, Buck really had good advantages over the default tools that we used. The fact that we could generate projects, that we could just have, any, or have everyone generate the projects that they want out of the huge code base. The fact that we have a distributed cache that makes compiling so much faster on our CI. And the fact that we had a completely custom built system, which is open source, where we could compile or we could add anything we want was something that was super useful for us. Um, much better than relying on the custom tools that vendors supply. It did have some challenges, though. So a detail about Swift is that um, Apple made it in such a way that it's very interoperable with Objective-C. It is, however, very hard. Um, the slides that I showed are very simple examples of just Swift. Um, but once you start to mix that in one of the single targets, the graph becomes quite complicated. Another issue we had when we started doing this is that um, Swift is not designed for remote cacheable artifacts. The Swift modules are not in a stable state. Um, it's a binary format that can still change between every Swift release. So until there is ABI stability, um, there might still occasionally be a bug in actually caching these Swift modules because they might be dependent on some file which is on the developer's local computer. We haven't seen a lot of issues with this, but this is something that Facebook uh, encountered when they were using the project. Then a last challenge, uh, which we want to work on, is ABI-based caching in Swift, where currently the rookies are computed based on the source file, because the source might not actually change the ABI of the resulting binary if you're changing private implementation details. You don't actually have to recompile a lot. So this is something we see uh, as a potential win. So I would definitely encourage you to look at Facebook bug repo on GitHub and give it a give it a try. This is my talk. Thank you very much. And are there any questions? Okay. Thank you. <laughs>